anybody that may not have heard yet, but Yolanda Phillips passed away this week. And uh, her funeral will be here Tuesday at 10 a.m. at the church. Uh, keep them in your prayers. Uh, LaVon's husband, Joe, is struggling with some kind of illness. They're not exactly sure which uh, yet, but uh, they were mentioning different possibilities, but no diagnosis as of yet. So Joe Turner is his name. Uh, keep him in your prayers. So, uh, are there any other prayer requests or um, updates to the prayer list? Yes. I have a phrase. I got in with a spinal specialist. Charlottesville. You all know I'm disabled and for years I've had oh, pain, just disgusting. But at any rate, um, I've developed scoliosis and I have a lot of other things are showing. But they feel that with today's modern medicine, they're going to be able to help. And hearing those words after so many years, I unfortunately broke down and cried. But at any rate, I just praise God because I just wasn't expecting to hear we can help you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anything else? Uh, yes, Pat? Um, be with me, Greg, and myself tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, about 10 o'clock, I'll probably be going under the surgery. We'll get about four hours, I think. So we need your prayers. And be with my sister. She's having some eye problems. Very serious. Okay. Your sister's having eye problems. Anything else? Yes. Dickie's cousin Ronnie is having surgery on Wednesday. Okay. Dickie's cousin Ronnie having surgery on Wednesday. Anything else? Yeah, in the back. Uh, I'd like to pray for all of our grandparents as they travel to uh, New Orleans uh, this morning uh, for safe travels. To and from. All right. Safe travels for Autumn and grandparents as they're heading down to New Orleans. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think I've ever been to New Orleans. Take as much rain as we can get at this point, right? Even if it does turn to steam as soon as it hits the ground. <laughs> Sounds like we need to pray for Donna, too. Oh, yeah, she's got a cold.
Donna couldn't hear. What was wrong? She's going through breast cancer treatment. Breast cancer treatment. Okay. Anything else before we go to prayer? All right. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have been so kind to us. Through the years, Lord, you've seen us through many crises. You've seen us through many questions. You have sustained us, Lord, in spite of the fact that this life would bowl us under. And now, Lord, we come before you once again. The God who has always been so kind and so gentle and so tender with us. And the God who has also given us discipline at the times we needed it the most. And we ask, God, you would be with us. Lord, you have heard these requests that have been spoken before your throne. We pray, Lord, for those that are struggling with cancer. And I pray, Father, that your hand would be on them, especially those that are fresh in our minds. And Lord, I pray that you would also be with those that are struggling with uh, occupation and financial things that are often unspoken requests for how can we confront our, our brothers and sisters uh, with our ongoing financial issues. Lord, we need these to be between you and us, and we need you, Lord, to deliver us. God, you may your hand be on us and help us to do what is right. I pray, Father, that your hand would be on us for our relationship issues and needs that we have. We need great wisdom, Lord. It's so easy to stumble over the tongue. It's so easy, Lord, to say something in error. It's so easy, Lord, to inflame people who you didn't mean to inflame. And we need wisdom, Lord, as we proceed through all of the different uh, relationship uh, that we have, whether business, whether personal. God, your hand please upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the answers to prayer that you've given to us in the past and have given to us even now. I pray, Father, that you would be with those that are going into surgery. And I pray, Father, for those that are anticipating uh, a potential surgery that may actually help. And I pray, God, your hand would be with them to protect them through all of this. Help them, Lord, I pray, to walk through these uh, dark waters, but to walk through them, Lord, knowing that it's okay because you are with them. I pray, Father, for those that are involved in our emergency services and in our military, that your hand would be on them. Be also, Lord, with our missionaries, I pray. Help them to bring the gospel, Lord, to those who need it. And help them, Lord, I pray, once they're done, bring them home again safely. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are going to turn to Genesis 21 which is where we are in our, our, walk, our walk through the Bible. And we're looking today at verses 11 to 21. Sarah has just said that Ishmael and Hagar must leave the family. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, and he sent, he, he sent them on her shoulders and then sent off Set her off with the boy. She went on her way, 
and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, the, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he, had, as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Now, this particular passage is one that we must remember is included for a reason. Uh, this passage is not here because God didn't have anything better to do. I want to talk to you about the benevolence of God before I move into this first paragraph. I want to be sure that we understand something here before we move. God's benevolence applies to both saved and unsaved. It applies to both those that are his children and those that are not his children. If you're saved, God calls you with affection. If you're not, he calls you wicked. Though, what is wickedness? Wickedness is a self-invented wisdom. Your self-invented wisdom is to God wickedness. Uh, anything that is opposed to God's will or anything that is opposed to his holiness is wickedness. And while you may say, well, does God have the right to have that opinion? I would say that the scripture is teaching us certainly he does because he's the creator and we're a product of his creative imagination, which means that we really only have one allegiance in this life. Whether we acknowledge that allegiance or do not acknowledge that allegiance is irrelevant. Everybody owes their life to God. Everybody owes their life to the one that created them. We don't any of us own our own life. Uh, as the scripture says in Ezekiel, it says, all souls are mine. This is God's claim. All souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Everything that God has to say about the wicked ultimately is repent and ultimately is that they will be destroyed. Two things God gives the wicked a choice of, repent or be destroyed. But there's no other option. There's no other, there's no option where God just leaves you alone and lets you do whatever you want to do and doesn't call you to account for it. That's just not one of the options that we have in the scripture. So saying all of that, I want us to take a look quickly here at the story. Ishmael was born not of promise, but of the flesh. That is that Abraham and Sarah got together, they colluded, they came up with this idea, they dragged Hagar into it, and Hagar had a child on behalf of her mistress, Sarah, and they named him Ishmael. But God still kept his promise and gave Sarah a son that came from her own body, and that is Isaac. Now, Isaac is the son through whom God is going to create his nation. God is creating a nation in this story we have in Genesis. Okay, all the other nations they formed on their own. From the Tower of Babel, they all got together with people they could understand linguistically. Then they settled in lands 
the Japhethites settled up to the north, the Shemites to the, to the middle, and then the Hamites to the south. And this was before, of course, the continents were divided so that everybody got to their land, then the continents divided, and some peoples were separated from the rest, which is why we didn't know North and South America were there, we didn't know Australia was there, and we discovered those at later dates. Okay? Not that they weren't already there, obviously, but for us, from our perspective, not knowing they were there, it was a discovery. Okay, now all of this happened, and God didn't interfere with those nations. They just developed on their own. They did, you know, they, they had their own language. They eventually developed their own culture. Then they began to speciate, and that, that is, they began to take on different uh, different aspects, some of them light skin, some of them dark skin, some of them specific facial or body features even. And um, eventually, why uh, we were as separate as separate could be, and that was a purpose, and God said that it was so that being divided, we wouldn't be able to join together as uh, mankind and put God in the position of having to destroy us again. So, uh, so God... Uh, separated us in that fashion. Now, all of that said, because I want us to understand that with Israel, this is a specific creation of God. It is a holy nation. Holy, why? Because the people were holy? No. In fact, we read very clearly that the people were not holy. Uh, they were supposed to be holy. They were commanded to be holy, but they did not live holy lives. But that is to an end with regards to salvation anyway. But this nation that God created is his nation. Nobody touched it. Nobody helped him create it. Nobody pitched in and gave him an idea where he said, oh, hey, that's a good idea. That never happened with God. God knew exactly what he wanted to do from the very beginning. And he began to develop this nation. And he developed a holy nation, which was his nation, Nobody was allowed to touch it. Anybody that tried to help them or tried to form it, they were either immediately or eventually killed. Um, there is just no room in God's creation of a holy nation for us <coughs> to add our two bits to it. And so, that being the case, Ishmael could not be a part of the nation. And he could not be the leader of the nation, so God exiled him. Now, Sarah was the one that did the exiling, but God said Sarah was telling Abraham the right thing to do. So Ishmael is cut off from his family. Isaac is promoted because he's the one that God wants to bring the nation into existence through his offspring. So what do we do with Ishmael? Ishmael was an invention. Ishmael was not God's thing. It was Adam and Sarah, or Abraham and Sarah's thing. Okay, so it wasn't God's thing. But because he was Abraham's son, God wanted to treat him kindly. <clears throat> And so God developed him into a nation and, and uh, God kind of set him off and let him develop on his own. But God continued to develop Isaac. Now, in studying the benevolence of God upon the wicked, the one thing we have to realize is that God is very kind, very loving, very caring towards wicked men. But in the end, he's still going to send them to hell. Nothing you can do about that. In the end, that's where they're going to go. But for these 80 years or so that they live on this earth, God tends to be uh, quite kind to them because that's all that they're going to have. So let's take a look, first of all, the consolation of God. God consoles Hagar and consoles Ishmael with a promise that they would become a nation. Um, and 
in the consolation of God, God gives men lesser blessings. And I say lesser because the greater blessing would be heaven. Um, but the wicked tend to get blessed with the things of this world. Now looking in Psalm 73 and uh, verses 1 to 5, uh, the writer of the psalm <coughs> says this, <coughs> Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But, now whenever you see the conjunctive but, you must understand that he has said something and now he is going to change subjects. Okay? Whenever you are talking to somebody, I was going to go to the store, but my car ran out of gas. Okay, so anytime the word but is used, you're changing direction. So he starts out by assuring the reader, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Now, this is the observation. Now, there's more to the passage than that, of course. But uh, I, I wanted you to see the observation of the psalmist. When he looks at the wicked, he doesn't see people that don't believe in God and are just suffering and suffering and suffering because of it. Rather, he sees people that don't believe in God and they're doing well. Now, you and I have observed such, haven't we? You remember the old show with Robin Leach, Launch Doyles of the Rich and Famous? Remember that? He'd always shout whatever it was. Amazing! Look at this pool. Look at all these things, you know. And that was, of course, a show that was designed to build up covetousness in the uh, viewer so that the viewer would say, why don't I have stuff like that? It's not fair they have stuff like that, and I don't have stuff like that. That was the whole point of the show. But all of those people, most of the people, at least, and probably all, that were featured in a show like that are not people that uh, believed in God and gave sacrificially to, to the cause of Christ and, and uh, served and honored Him. These are people that served and honored themselves. Most of them were movie stars. Most of them were, were uh, business owners that were rather ruthless in their business approaches and things. Um, but not people that by any means, for the most part at least, although I never watched every episode, barely watched one to be honest with you, but I did watch from time to time because I thought it was interesting the different things that they could do. But folks, we have to be careful when we're looking to people that don't believe in God and are doing well. The scripture is, tell, is trying to tell us that this is a consolation for them. What does it mean, a consolation? You ever watch a game show? Anybody ever? No, nobody, just me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm the only one that ever watched a game show. At the end of the game show, they had consolation prizes, right? Back in the day, you remember that? Sometimes it was a home version of the game, and uh, there for a long while, I don't know why Rice Aroni was so generous, but the Rice Aroni was always like, like a lifetime supply of rice and roti, the San Francisco Dream. <coughs> and so you, you remember some of these consolation prizes. It wasn't the best prize. It wasn't the top prize. It wasn't the thing that everybody was on that game show and wanted to win. But it was like, you know, so you don't feel so bad about not winning. Here's something for you to take home. Okay? Now, you need to understand this. The wicked around you, that is, those who deny God's sovereignty in their life, they deny God's place as creator, 
They deny God's kingship. They deny God's lordship in their lives. These people who are not going to go to heaven, God gives them the consolation prize of letting them have life however they want it or can build it. And so some of them do very well. Some of them do very poorly. And God doesn't interfere. When you see people that have a lot of things and you know that they don't go to church, they swear their, you know, their, their <coughs> morals are, are horrible and all of this kind of thing that you're looking at. When you see that and you say, well, good lands, I give everything I have to God. I, I struggle to just to make ends meet. And I go to church and, and I believe in God and yet it just seems like God just isn't there for me the way he is for the wicked. And you get frustrated and Asaph says, my feet almost slipped. I almost stumbled. Then at the end of the Psalm, Psalm 73, he says, and then I remembered their end. I remembered their end. When God lets the wicked do well in this life, it's because he's nice. But it's not because he approves. Jeremiah 12, 1 to 2. You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring your case before you. Now, he's doing the same thing that Asaph did here. Because the next word is yet. It's like but. You're changing direction. You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet, I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them, and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Do you see, folks, both the psalmist and Jeremiah speak to God and they say something is wrong here. <clears throat> because the concept is that if these people are wicked, their lives on this earth should be really bad and the lives of the righteous should be really sweet. But instead, what tends to happen is the lives of the righteous people are full of struggles and full of pain. And often the lives of the wicked are only full of the pain that they have self-inflicted. And many people who don't know the Lord have property and houses and wonderful things that they can just... They can just relax. They can be at ease. They always have the money to go to the best doctors. They always have the opportunity to fly to the nicest vacation spots. They always have all of this stuff. And it just seems like they go to bed and they've got stuff. They get up and they've got stuff. And what happens is that many people who at first believe in the Lord take a look at that and they say, well, what good is it for me to be a Christian? I thought that if I became a Christian, I'd get stuff. Jesus calls those the stony soil. Those are the shallow ones, the ones who think that they're going to get stuff because they're Christians. But then when the sun comes out and bakes them, that is, trials come to them, they say, well, What's the use of being a Christian? What's the use of, you know, if, if this is the way it's going to be, no, then forget it. The next thing that we see here is consolation. God's consolation is common kindness. Looking at Matthew chapter 5. And then we're looking at verse 43 to 48.
You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So if you love those who love you only, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, don't take verse 48 out of context, okay? I've heard it taken out of context before to say that you and I are required under, even under grace, to be absolutely perfect and that if you fail, you gotta go back to the starting line. Um, that's not the scripture, that's not, that's not what this means. In context, it's talking about being an imitator of God as dearly beloved children. Okay, we see this in Galatians chapter five, okay? So, or maybe it's Ephesians five, but still. Be imitators of God as dearly beloved children, the scripture says. Now, here it's saying that we need to do what? Be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. God shows love not only to his children, but God also shows love to his enemies. God doesn't just send the sun and the rain and the, and the necessities of life on his children. He also does on his enemies. So then he says to you, so don't treat the people you're familiar with and love differently than you treat the people that you're unfamiliar with and don't necessarily love. Because if your father in heaven is kind to his children and to his enemies, you should also be kind not only to your church members and church family, but you should be kind to those that are outside of the church. Now, this does not mean the same level of trust, the same level of love, and all of that. Okay, otherwise the, the, those outside of the kingdom wouldn't be your enemies for Christ's sake. Okay? So they are your enemies, which means that you're, you're not to love them the way you love your church family. Your church family, you're to love them with a certain amount of complacency, which means you're supposed to be at ease with your family, with your church family. You're supposed to be able to trust your church family, which is why the trust of the church is so hugely important, and we guard that uh, as you know as fiercely as we can. The church board and I. Okay, we guard that. And that being the case. I want us to understand that, that as a Christian, you really do have enemies. They're the enemies of God. The enemies of God are your enemies. Even if they're your friends, uh, for growing up with them and for hanging out with them and rubbing elbows with them, it doesn't matter. If they're not in the kingdom of God, then for the sake of the cross, they're your enemies. Uh, and, and you must remember that. You, you, can't trust those outside of the kingdom of God to be like those inside of the kingdom of God. Two different kinds of people. But we show love to both those we can trust and love and those we don't trust and love. We still show kindness to both. Now the reason that we do is because God does. There's no moral virtue in it. There's no, no I'm a better person because of it. That's not the reason. That's not even, you're, you're not even going to achieve that. Okay? You do it just simply because the God that you serve does it. And so you're being an imitator of God as a dearly beloved child. Let's see. Now, each of the wicked that we see in the scripture, the, the references talk about them having troubled days. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty three. Let's turn there real quick. Proverbs. 
Proverbs 11.23. It says, the desire of the righteous ends only in good, but the hope of the wicked only in wrath. Okay? Now, the scripture is not giving you an approximation or a guess. It's giving you specific. Okay? The, the work of the righteous, the hope of the righteous ends in good. The hope of the wicked ends in wrath. And so, while God is being benevolent to the wicked, in the end, it's going to end in wrath. That's just the way it's going to be. But he's good to his children as well. But their hope is that God is going to be good to them at the end of all things when the time of reckoning comes. In Genesis 16, 12, we read a little bit more about uh, Ishmael. We've already been there in our walk through the scriptures, but I invite you to return there as well with me. If you would. 16, and uh, then uh, I think, did I say 21? No, 12. Got my letters backwards. There he is. Okay, speaking of Ishmael, God says, He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So here we have the benevolence of God as Hagar and Ishmael are running from Abraham's presence. But she had already been told this about Ishmael. That he would be a wild donkey of a man. His hand would be against everyone around him and everyone against him. And yet, the promise is that God is going to make him into a nation. And that kings are going to come from his line. So there's going to be kings, there's going to be a nation. The Ishmaelites are going to be a, a nomadic people. They're going to be lifting up their heel against everybody and everybody's going to be against them. But this is the way it's going to be. So in spite of the fact that Ishmael is going to prosper, Ishmael is also going to have trouble in the prosperity. And he will be trying to overcome his neighbors and his neighbors will be trying to overcome him. Now this is the way that it is right now in the world. Have you not heard nice guys finish last? Have you, have you not heard that uh, if you're going to make an omelet, you've got to break a few eggs? The wickedness of men has gotten so bad. It's not only hit business, it's hit friendships, it has hit politics, it has hit journalism. It has hit every aspect of life. There used to be a book that was written that was called uh, Looking Out for Number One. One of the most wicked books that ever existed. Every time somebody tells you to put yourself first over other people in your life, they are encouraging you to be wicked. Anytime you're belly aching on Facebook, about how rotten you're being treated in this world, and somebody comes and says, you deserve better than that. You know, you're, 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 you're a good person, you deserve better than that. They're encouraging you to be wicked. And you say, well, where then is my consolation? Well, if you're a Christian, your consolation should be in the scripture. If you're not a Christian, you're going to find your consolation wherever you can find it, I guess. But God is very specific. In his benevolence to the wicked, God does not abandon his call to repent and his warnings of wrath. 
So I want to talk about this aspect of his benevolence, the passive, present benevolence of God, both present and passive. There we go. First of all, this is the God who sees. As we saw in Genesis 16, 13 to 14, um, which I think we're already close to anyways, if you've got your scriptures open, we'll just back up a page, read it. 13 and 14, following what we just read. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that is why the well is called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So here, Hagar, who is not going to be a part of God's kingdom and whose son is not going to be a part of God's kingdom looks to the God that has shown her benevolence and she names where she is God sees me or the well of seeing and so God has shown Hagar that he cares about what happens to Hagar. And Hagar responds, this is the God who sees me. The scripture says in Proverbs 15.3, which we're going to turn to, It says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. So God's eyes are not just concerned with his people, but he's concerned with the wicked. He pays attention to them. He pays attention to you and he pays attention to them. He doesn't have the same attitude towards them as he has towards you if you've been saved. But he is present. God is not absent at any time in the lives of those who care about him or don't care about him. He's present in proclamation. As we look in Acts 17. We see there in uh, verses 26 to 27. From one man made he all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find them though he is not far away from any one of us. So let's take a look at what Paul is saying here. He's saying that God set the boundaries of the different countries and that there were appointed times in history for those countries to exist. And when the appointed time came for a country to take over another country or for a country to be eliminated, then those boundaries were also set as well. So as time goes on and history develops and country after country it exists, they don't exist fully on their own, but they exist at the appointment of God. Now does it say here that God interfered? No, other than setting boundaries, God did not interfere. Other than setting boundaries, so he did set boundaries for those that he did not create uh, his own country for. So we see also that he did this so that they might seek him out. The call of salvation goes out through the whole world. But as Jesus said in Matthew 22, 
Many are called, but few are chosen. Now this doesn't mean that those who are called all responded to the call. But it means those who were chosen responded to the call. God calls men everywhere to repent. He commands them to repent. This is later on here in Acts 17, verse 30. God commands men everywhere to repent. So God is not unkind to the nations. He reveals himself enough to them, Romans chapter 1 says, that they should call out on him. But the problem is, Romans chapter 3 says, that there is none righteous, no, not one, no one who does good, no one who seeks after God. The sin nature so grips men that even though they are aware of God, they refuse to seek him out. And so it is not upon God who has laid out the call, but upon the nations whose nature would not even consider them calling out upon the Lord. Last of all, the absence of divine discipline. As we take a look at Hebrews Chapter 12. And we're looking here at um, verses 5 through 8. It says this, And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his own. Endure hardship and dis as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So in his benevolence, God assists the wicked with common graces and allows them to pursue whatever they would like to pursue and does not tell them no. It is in the not telling them no that we see whether they are truly children of God or not. For if they were children of God, God would set boundaries and he would enforce the boundaries. Those who God loves, God disciplines. And when God disciplines, it is not a punishment. Punishment is for proving a point. Discipline is like coaching. It's there to teach you how to be better. It's there to teach you how to stay in bounds and play the game by the rules. This is what the Lord's discipline is like for you and I. So the benevolence of God is seen everywhere around us. The call to salvation has gone out into all of the nations, but only those that are the sheep of God are responding. For as the scripture said, he has chosen us in him from the creation of the world. And so the gospel continues to be preached. As every generation emerges, more of the sheep of Christ emerge, as more of the sheep of Christ emerge, the gospel continues to go out. 
And we are here to seek and to save that which is lost. That was the mission of Christ, our head, and it is certainly the mission of his body, the church. To seek means to look through. To save means to redeem. <coughs> we are not here to try and get everybody into heaven. We are here to try and find those that God is bringing to himself. And this is something, folks, that we don't know. We have no idea who's, who's a sheep of God and who's not a sheep of God until they're saved. And when they're saved, oh, glory, glory. Oh, we would that everyone would be saved. But unfortunately, Jesus told us that broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads to destruction and many there are who find it. But narrow is the gate and rough is the way that leads to eternal life and few there are who find it. So our job is not to narrow the broad gate or to broaden the narrow gate. Our job is to acknowledge the truth and live within bounds. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's uh, say the Romans doxology together as we conclude. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen.
Let's have our closing prayer. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.